and do not buy into policies which would reduce economic growth rate. If you want to be wealthy when you are an old person or even a middle-aged person, support politicians who understand the importance of economic growth. And do you think that these green policies right now would have the potential to thwart economic growth going forward? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a killer. This notion that we are going to make energy especially very expensive through solar and wind and unreliable, that has a potential to destroy everything because energy goes into, well, everything. Love and light, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of El Podcast, the greatest virtual happy hour in the world. My name is Kai Primo, and this episode will be hosted by my fiance and super co-host, Jesse Wright. If you are new to our channel and you're not yet subscribed, please subscribe and all the links will be in the description below. Our guest today is Dr. Marion Tuvi. He is the co-author of the book, Super Abundance, the story of population growth, innovation, and human flourishing on an infinitely bountiful planet. We thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. I'm going to give you my quick 30-second summary of your book, Super Abundance. Basically, humanity has a tendency for apocalyptic, end of days, doomsday thinking. Today, organized faith has been replaced with new forms of religion, such as wokeism and especially radical environmentalism. The Garden of Eden is now unfettered nature. The devils are hydrocarbons such as oil and CO2. Our saints are Greta Thunberg. The priesthood are scientists. The Bible is the IPC. C reports and indulgences are carbon credits or donating money to nonprofits. Humans are not cancers of the earth, but are the only species that has the capacity to invent and create abundance for all living things. The more people on planet earth, the more Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Nikola Tesla's, Nelson Mandela's, Vincent Van Gogh's, and Michael Jackson's that innovate our way to super abundance. Is this a fair assessment of your book? Yes, it is. Very well done. Talking to one of my friends about your book, and I gave him that analogy, and he said it was basically spot on. Today, people are essentially being atheists, not believing in God and replacing religion with whether that be environmentalism, wokeism, cancel culture, or some other ism. How did we get to the point where we've replaced the Bible with green energy or any other ism? So our book is a secular book. We don't take an issue with people who believe in God or people who don't believe in God. We try to analyze certain human impulses. I think that the fundamental human impulse is to make sense of the world, to have a meaning in life, to participate in something larger, to be part of a group. The atheists may well be right in saying that there is ultimately no meaning to life except that everything is arbitrary, everything is random, but that's not how human psychology acts. Human psychology basically needs to have a sense of meaning, a sense of the transcendental. Whether you are an atheist or whether you are a religious person, there is a God-shaped hole in your heart that you try to fill in with some sort of a meaning. What is it all about? Where am I going? Who am I? these sorts of things. In the past, obviously, religion played a much greater role in our lives. You have the great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. You have polytheistic religions, but they all fundamentally give you the same sort of thing, which is imbue your life with a sense of meaning, with a sense of purpose. They give you a structure to your daily life, etc. In the advanced Western countries, that obviously starts disappearing in the 20th century. We are more irreligious in the traditional sense than ever. Again, I'm not taking any sides. It's just a fact. But as G.K. Chesterton said, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. And so into this void created by the decline of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, whatever, in the West have entered pseudo-religions or new religions. And one of them is the green religion, the belief in Mother Gaia as God or goddess, if you will. We have in the green religion the analogy to the Garden of Eden, which is the unspoiled earth before industrialization, 
We have the devils to the fossil fuel companies, the CEOs. We have our saints, Greta Thunberg. We have indulgences, which allow you to give a few thousand pounds to a green cause, and then you can fly around the world on a private jet, creating a lot of environmental damage. So basically, God and Christianity may be on its way out in certain parts of the West, but they've been replaced by just another alternative way of believing in something greater than yourself. So that's how we ended there. And like any religion, the green religion also has within it the aspect of an apocalypse, the end of days, the eschatology. And in the case, of course, of the green religion, in the words of Al Gore, oceans will boil. In the words of AOC, we literally have only 12 years before the world ends and things like that. Do you think that Al Gore and the AOC actually believe this. You have a lot of people now talking about the World Economic Forum and how they want to create a digital currency and tie that digital currency to a wallet, to carbon credits as a way to control people. Or do you think that's more of a conspiracy theory and these politicians really do think that they're saving the world and they're saving us from apocalyptic consequences from, in their eyes, overpopulation? Well, since it is impossible to see into people's minds, I try not to answer that question with a yes or no. I think that like in any type of a movement, any type of ideology from fascism to communism to even belief in traditional religions, you will have some people who truly believe it. Then you will have some people who are sort of lukewarm about it. Then there are others, who, the people who just want to get along. And then you will have cynical people who are just using it in order to achieve great or other types of goals. So I don't know whether Al Gore really believes it. What I do know is that he has made hundreds of millions of dollars from it. That doesn't mean that he doesn't believe it, but he certainly used it to his advantage. A much more likely candidate for a true believer would be somebody like Greta Thunberg, who seems to really imbue the sainthood, the suffering and self-sacrificing believer in the green god. But when it comes to Davos, I don't see Davos as a conspiracy, partly because Davos puts most of their stuff online. I mean, you can watch these people, you can watch their videos, you can watch live streaming. I don't believe it's some sort of a Illuminati or some sort of a secret society. They are far too visible for that sort of thing. I, I think something else is going on. And that is that Davos is basically the, the place to go if you want to be seen as being rich, famous, and influential. If you don't get invited into Davos, it probably means that you are not as important as you think you are. So you want to be invited to go there. And once you are there, it takes real courage to stand up and talk against the established wisdom. It, as far as I can tell from the videos that I've seen from their panels and things like that, it's basically a place where people go on repeating what is expected of them to say in order to be invited back, in order to be considered to be good citizens of the world. And right now, what's the most important thing in the sort of the intellectual sphere, the intellectual ether? It is environmentalism. So let's say that you are a CEO of a company, you get invited into Davos, uh, you're not going to tell them that environmental concerns are overblown. You're going to go there and repeat what you're expected to be saying. And then you get the positive coverage and everybody, you know, slaps you on the back and says what a good chap you are. And maybe whilst you are there, you're going to have a few meetings with other CEOs and you're going to conclude a good business deal for your shareholders. So it's really just a place for famous people to mingle and to repeat the conventional wisdom. That's what I think is going on with Davos. Now, that doesn't mean that um, the long-term effects of Davos don't have to be negative. In fact, they could be, because, of course, when the ruling elite, the CEOs, the presidents, the heads of parliaments, and so on, when they all drink from the same fountain and they all get the same virus, then they can all behave in the same way and implement the same policies. A perfect example of that is what's happening in Europe right now. They've all been drinking from the same fountain. They all got the same virus, the same bug. 
they implemented these absolutely insane environmental policies. And when Putin invaded Ukraine, suddenly none of the energy plans in Europe made any sense. The price of electricity went through the roof and they had to ration energy. That's because they all bought into this myth that we should be producing less energy rather than more in a less reliable rather than more reliable fashion. So there can be negative consequences, but I don't think it's a conspiracy. It's more like uh, a fashion. Mm, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Why is it human nature to have apocalyptic and pessimistic thinking? Pretty much everyone believes that overpopulation is a problem. The crux of your book is that the more people, the more abundance. Why do people tend to gravitate towards negative thoughts? Well, I think that we have evolved to be pessimistic about things fundamentally for hundreds of thousands of years. So Homo sapiens is about 300,000 years old. And for most of that time, the world was really a very dangerous place. I mean, let's say that you are a single person. Uh, you just got some water in a jug and you're walking through a bush and you hear a noise behind a tree. You have two options. You can simply think, oh, it's probably nothing. And if there's a lion and he eats you, then all those optimistic genes get weeded out of the gene pool, right? But if you are somebody who is deeply suspicious and says, oh, it's probably a lion, I'm going to run away, then those genes get passed down onto the future generations. So I think that optimists, more likely than not, got weeded out of the gene pool and the pessimism and pessimistic genes persisted. In other words, to put it in a more academic jargon, the overreaction to a non-existent threat is less costly than an underreaction to a real threat. If you underreact to a real threat, the costs are basically your genes end with you. So we have developed a lot of these negativity biases as we have evolved. One of them is that we tend to focus on negative rather than positive news. We know that because even in laboratory settings, when you have a cohort who says that they are more interested in positive news rather than negative news. If on a split screen, you start showing them negative and positive news, the eyes immediately gravitate toward the negative news. So it's deeply ingrained in our psyche. And that plays a role because then the media obviously leads with the most horrific news. If it bleeds, it leads. The newspapers understand and the news shows on TV understand that when they lead with the most horrific, the most bloody story, they are going to get many more eyeballs on that story than if they lead with something much more mundane. Also, there are other negative biases, like, for example, bad is stronger than good. We fear losses and we feel suffering much more than we appreciate gains and uh, feel happiness. Uh, if you think about it, if you ask yourself a question, how much happier could I be than I am currently? versus how much more unhappy I could be than I am currently. Well, the unhappiness scale is, is just never ending. You could get a phone call saying your entire family got wiped out in a car crash, your house got burned down, you have cancer, etc. So the point is that bad is much more powerful than good. In the first chapter of the book, we go through many of these negative devices, but essentially we have evolved to be pessimistic and probably for a good reason, because the world was a much less hospitable place than it is today. Do you think social media has increased the negativity? It seems like people are less happy ever since we've had social media, whether that's Twitter or Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, etc. I don't know the full story behind how media interacts with the human brain. Other people like Jonathan Haidt are much better to talk to about that. I, I would need to read, uh, read up on that. But I will say just a few things that I do know because I looked into them. One thing is that social media make everything more intimate and more immediate. So if you were living in 17th century or 18th century England and there was a massive earthquake on the other side of the world, you would never have heard about it or maybe heard about it years later. It wouldn't make absolutely any difference in terms of how you feel. But now you can see a tsunami in Japan or an earthquake in Turkey on your phone, basically as it's happening. So that makes you also feel more vulnerable. Just knowing that these things go on, whereas previously you wouldn't know that they go on, impacts how you perceive the likelihood of things happening to you, right? I mean, if this is happening right now in front of me, it's so immediate, you can, you can almost smell 
what's happening there and hear the screams of the people in Turkey, that makes you, I think, that obviously must have an impact in a sense of making you feel more vulnerable than, than you would be if you didn't know about it or alternatively, if you were aware of the seismological history of your region and know that you probably live in an area where things like that don't happen. We also know that people's anxiety has risen, especially amongst women when it comes to social media and that sort of thing. On the other hand, social media is also helpful in many ways. It's also very new. It's not entirely clear that it has to persist in its current form, right? Because people need some time to adjust to new technologies and figure out what makes them happy and what makes them unhappy. Ten years ago, Facebook was a big thing. Facebook is apparently dying. A few years ago, we were worried about Google and that sort of thing. Now, chat GPT seems to be impacting that. We are worrying about TikTok. Who knows what's coming around the corner? I hear of a lot of young people anecdotally who are switching off social media because they realize it's not making them happy. When it comes to new technological breakthroughs, you tend to need at least some time to adjust and to figure out how you want to interact with it. I think it's early days and I would urge you to have somebody like Jonathan Haidt on to talk about it. I appreciate that recommendation. The 1968 bestseller, Population Bomb, and the 1972 classic, Limits to Growth, both of these books popularized the message that the earth can't handle more people and that overpopulation will lead to poverty, decimation of natural resources, and the overall destruction of the planet. Both of these books are still widely influential today, yet are both atrociously wrong and have been proven wrong over the last five decades again and again. Why is it so counterintuitive to say that population growth creates abundance? Well, because people think in terms of atoms, of limited atoms. Everybody knows there is only so many atoms of zinc or copper. There is only so much water in the world. There is only so much I don't know, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. We think in atoms. And obviously, when you add people, then logically, that implies that you are going to have fewer atoms per person, eventually, you're going to run out and you're going to die. But if you think in knowledge, not in terms of atoms, but in terms of knowledge, then you realize that the limited number of atoms actually doesn't matter. Let me give you just one example. The Earth has exactly the same amount of atoms on it, or pretty close to exactly the same amount of atoms on it, the same natural resources that it had in the time of the Stone Age, okay? In the time of the Stone Age, the world had as much iron and zinc and copper and water, and there were maybe 200 or 300 million people in the world, maybe many fewer than that. Today, there is 8 billion of us, and we are infinitely richer than the people in the Stone Age. So clearly, atoms cannot matter all that much because the natural endowment of the Earth hasn't changed. It's exactly the same what it was 300,000 years ago or, or 2 million years ago. But we are much richer, even though there are many more of us. So we need to switch thinking in terms of limited atoms to thinking in infinite knowledge and this is where people play a role. The more people you have, the more ideas you have, the more knowledge you create, the more innovations you can create, which then translate into increased standards of living, increased productivity and standards of living. So essentially, human beings are important because they are the creators of new knowledge. And when you have new knowledge, you can derive more value from the same atoms. Think about something as a grain of sand. There is a beautiful picture of maybe Hawaii behind you. There's a surfboard behind you. So you guys are a beach going crowd. You're all familiar with sand. It's been lying around for billions of years. It was completely useless until about three and a half thousand years ago, somebody figured out that if you heat sand to 3,090 degrees Fahrenheit, you can turn it into glass. And so about three and a half thousand years ago, in the Bronze Age, people started using glass beads as decoration. And then later, they turned glass into glass jars so they can drink from it. Later, into window panes. 
And with every step of the way, the value we got from a grain of sand increased. Now, sand is the main component in microchips and fiber optic cables, which are producing trillions of dollars of new value. So this is just a very simple example of showing that something as simple as sand, which was previously um, utterly useless and valueless, can suddenly generate tremendous amount of wealth, thereby improving the lives of our species. So we have to stop thinking in terms of atoms. We have to start thinking in terms of knowledge. And once you start thinking in terms of knowledge, you don't have to worry too much about the limited number of atoms in the world because we can always use them in an increasingly valuable way. You wrote in your book that between 1820 and 2015, the world population rose from 1.09 billion to 7.38 billion, an increase of 6.8 times over the same period. The world economy grew from 1.2 trillion to 108 trillion or 90 times the population. Then it grew at a compounded rate of slightly less than 1% per year, while GDP grew at a compounded rate of 2.33% per year. That may not seem like much of a difference, but the effect of compounding over 200 years ensured that the economy would grow 13 times faster than the population, thereby producing a 14-factor increase in the average global outcome. Can you break down this data for us? Sure. The way to think about the data is to simply say in 1800, when Thomas Jefferson was president of the United States, the world had 1 billion people. Now we have 8 billion people, but nobody would want to live in 1800 because you're very poor. Life expectancy was about 30, 35 years. GDP per capita around the world was somewhere between 2 and $3 per person per day about roughly one third of newborns died before the age of one. So life was just much more difficult, even though there were many fewer people in the world. And as we added more people, life became better. And that's because people produce more ideas. On average, human beings consume less than they produce. Yes, we are destroyers, we are consumers, but we also creators, right? So even though the world population is growing at 1% per year, GDP is growing 2.3%, and the difference between the two rates is the new knowledge which is created in the human mind. A baby born into the world is not just born with an empty stomach, but also with a brain capable of producing new ideas. And that's what it's all about. It's this knowledge. When you create more knowledge, you can improve lives of everybody. You know, what about the many reports that state that millennials are the first generation to be worse off than their parents in terms of life expectancy, job status, and lower home ownership rates? The average millennial has nearly $40,000 in student loan debt, and one-third of millennials also have some type of healthcare debt or medical debt. What would you say to a millennial who would tell you that they're worse off and are living less abundantly than their parents? Well, their parents, my parents, never had an iPhone, never had an access to the entirety of human knowledge at a moment's notice. The state of science and technology continues to improve. The likelihood that um, children born today or the millennials are going to live to the age of 100 or beyond is simply much higher than my generation or the generations before me. There are breakthroughs in biotech, there are big breakthroughs in medical care, all sorts of ways in which the young people of today are going to be much better off and living longer simply because of a natural progression of science. Lots of billions of dollars are being spent in life extension, new cancer drugs and cancer treatments and, and tests for early onset of cancer are coming online. So there's a lot of things that are happening. Let me also say... I think the likelihood that a child born today or a 20-year-old today is going to have a shorter life expectancy than me is pretty much zero. Uh, life expectancy has been increasing by an average of three months per year in the post-Second World War era. Now, it is true that because of COVID, life expectancy has decreased for three years in a row in the United States. So there's going to be a little decrease but I see no reason why it shouldn't go on increasing, especially given that 
we are going to create much more knowledge about how to keep people alive. It's not just going to be the fact that we have more people than ever in terms of scientists looking at it, but also remember that we have AI and supercomputing coming on board, which is going to be able to produce all sorts of drugs and treatments that our ancestors couldn't even dream about. So I, I don't think it is likely, in fact, I think it's highly unlikely that kids of today are going to be living for shorter periods of time than, than we do. In terms of GDP per capita, you just have to think about it for a second to realize how crazy that statement is. Uh, not your statement, but I, I, I know that a lot of people believe that. If the economy grows, so right now, American GDP per capita is about what, $150, $160 per person per day. If the economy grows at 2% per year, then by the end of this century, people are going to be six times richer, right? If the average or, or the median household income in the United States today is about $76,000, then by 2100, it's going to be 76,000 times six, whatever that is. And that's just if the economy continues to grow at 2% per year. If it grows at 3% per year, then everybody's going to be a millionaire. And that's what I would really like young people to focus on. Not so much focus on the predictions of doom and gloom, because there always have been doomsayers who have been predicting doom and gloom. Rather, focus on the long-term trends and ask yourself, do you still live in a country which can grow at 2 or 3% per year? If you start seeing our economic growth rate decline to 1% or 1.5%, then you know that by the time you're an old person, you're going to be much less off than if we grow at 2 or 3% a year. The key here is long-term economic growth rates. If those continue, the young people are going to be super wealthy compared to us. So focus on the long-term trends and do not buy into policies which would reduce economic growth rate. If you want to be wealthy when you're an old person or even a middle-aged person, support politicians who understand the importance of economic growth. Do you think that these green policies right now would have the potential to thwart economic growth going forward? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm an environmentally conscious person. I try to do my bit, but this is a killer. This notion that we are going to make energy, especially very expensive through solar and wind and unreliable, that has a potential to destroy everything because energy goes into, well, everything. And if it becomes expensive or unreliable, then of course it will have a huge impact on economic growth rate, which will slow. And we will all suffer as a consequence, not just less money in our pockets, but also less money on research, less money on going toward medical science and whatever. So this green obsession with renewables is a problem. And it's one of two or three major problems. The other problem is of course, over-regulation. Because even if we had cheap energy, but you overregulate the economy to a point where nobody sane would want to open a new business because it's just so difficult, then that would be very detrimental to economic growth as well. So we need to both look at regulation. Europe doesn't really produce any new groundbreaking ideas. If you want to have a new idea, you want to you want to develop a cell phone or internet or whatever, you have, you go to America. You don't do it in Europe because Europe is simply so overregulated. They have strangled their innovativeness, innovativeness, their innovation. We still are pretty innovative, even though we are highly regulated, but not as much as Europe. But the big problem here really is energy and how it's becoming more expensive and less reliable because of the fetishizing the green religion. Yeah, you talk a lot in in your book about how humans are very social animals and how humans compare themselves to other humans. I heard you in a previous interview, I think you said you got rid of Facebook and or social media in like 2012 because you realized that you're just having this curated platform and everyone else, of course, is doing the same thing. Do you think that people are comparing themselves to others with these social media platforms and they see their friends on vacation, even though they might be on vacation for one week, the whole year, they're constantly reposting photos from that one trip. So it looks like they're living this super lush lifestyle when in fact they're not. When I see the millennials saying that they're 
not better off than their parents. I think a lot of that is just because they're seeing this really curated lifestyle on the media that doesn't resemble at all what these people are actually living. Yes. So that would be part of the negative side of social media. Now, not everybody, of course, behaves like that. This is very important. I mean, part of that chapter in the book, when I talk about the theory of social comparison, is that not everybody falls down that well, right? I left Facebook when I realized that I was posting lies about my life and consuming lies about other people's lives. And therefore, I couldn't see any utility to it. And so I just left. I can do it. I'm not special. I'm not smarter. I'm not more hardworking or more committed than most other people. And so if I can do it, anybody can. Just get off. You won't miss it that much. Unless you are a narcissist who likes to post stuff about yourself and have other people envy what you have and they don't. So that's one thing. The other thing is, of course, that not everybody compares themselves to their peers in the same way. Some people may compare, you know, one vacation with the other vacation or a prettier girlfriend or boyfriend with a the per person's a boyfriend or girlfriend. But fundamentally, th there are other people who, who don't, who have other priorities in their lives. Maybe what they like to do is to read a book or listen to a concert or something like that. So people will compare to their peer groups in many different ways or not at all. It's more complicated than simply say that everybody has gone crazy because we see our peers doing better. But there is a way that there is a way around it. One is to leave social media, and the other one is to simply change your point of reference. Uh, happiness is a choice, and one way you can accomplish it is by don't compare yourself to people who are better off than you are. Compare yourself to people who are worse off than you are. The likelihood that a person living in the United States today, a young person, there is six or seven billion people who are much worse off than an average inhabitant of San Francisco or Dallas or Chicago, right? If you compare yourself to those people and practically to anybody who has ever lived until today, then you realize just how much better off you are. And maybe instead of envy, you develop an attitude of gratitude, which is much more conducive to happiness. Also, it's so destructive to compare yourself to other people who are better off because there is an infinite variety of ways in which somebody can be better off. It's not just that they can afford a better holiday, but maybe they are better looking. Maybe they are more intelligent. Maybe they are thinner. Maybe they are more athletic. So if you're going to compare yourself constantly to people who are better off than you are, then it's just, it's just a recipe for envy and unhappiness. But if you compare yourself to people who are not as well off, maybe worse off than you are, then I think the attitude is one of gratitude where you are really you consider yourself very lucky to be living in a time and in a place where you are living. And finally, you can start comparing yourself to yourself from year ago or 10 years ago and see how much progress you have made in your life. And as long as you're growing intellectually or materially, you can, you can compare yourself to your previous version and say, okay, have I better become a better person? And if so, then that's another reason to be happy. Would you consider yourself to be an optimistic person? Or do you think that you have to fight your pessimistic instincts to see the brighter side of everything? I don't think that I'm more optimistic by nature. I think I'm more analytical by nature. And what I mean by that is that I try to evaluate my actions and my responses and figure out what works and what doesn't. So there is a little bit of introspection going on there. And basically my introspection is very simple. I grew up under communism in Eastern Europe. We had very little. Life was tough. <laughs> we never knew that we'd be able to travel or read a newspaper without the newspaper being censored and that sort of thing. And so after communism collapsed in 1989, I was able to travel and make a career and that sort of thing. I was able to, I, I have that different perspective. I, I look at my past life and think, my God, I'm really very fortunate that I've ended up where I ended up rather than being still stuck behind the Iron Curtain. So I don't think it's that I'm by, by, by nature more optimistic, but I simply understand that I went through certain things in life, things have worked out, and uh, I should really be grateful 
for the way that things have worked out rather than resentful that I am not flying around the world on a private jet and sleeping with a supermodel. Those things may still come along, but unlikely they may still come along. But the bottom line is that I'm, I'm doing pretty well considering the low expectations I had of my life when I was leaving in behind the Iron Curtain. Speaking of growing up under communist rule, do you see any similarities today with cancel culture, wokeism, this extreme environmentalism, populism, climate alarmism? It's all in the rise in the United States. Are there sim any similarities today between communist Czechoslovakia and the United States of America in 2023? Yeah, they are, actually. When I was growing up, my parents told me there are certain things that you can say at home, but that you cannot say at school. At home, we would talk about the failures, the economic and political failures of the system under which we lived. But at school, I'd be praising the Communist Party, um, you know, as a five or 10 year old and raising my hand in support of the socialist regime. And something similar is happening in the United States. I was recently talking to a man who's got two boys in college, and he tells me that basically it's exactly the same. At home, they talk about everything openly about what's going on in the country. And at school, uh, they basically repeat the nostrums of political correctness. They basically repeat everything, all diversity statements and Marxism, postmodernism, BLM, I don't know uh, what, what else is out there. They basically say whatever the teachers expect them to say in order to get along, in order to get the marks so they can graduate and then go to a postgraduate school or get a job. But they don't believe it. They don't believe that they live in a horrible country. They don't believe that the oceans are going to boil and evaporate. They just repeat whatever, whatever the, the teacher expects them to, just like I did under communism. And when they come home, they have, a, they have a reasoned conversation about the things that this country is doing well and this country is doing badly. But they do it only with their parents or the people they can trust. And obviously, this is... This is very suboptimal. America shouldn't be like that. But I don't think this is going to persist. I see that people are losing their fear of the left, the far left. More and more comedians are making jokes about the insanity of political correctness and speech codes. And that's a good sign. We are losing our fear and we are starting to make fun of them. And I think that means that we have reached a peak woke. Maybe not at universities, but in a country as a whole, probably. How did we even get to the point where we're at peak woke? Well, I mean, the peak woke, in, in, in my view, would be symbolized by more and more people simply laughing it off. Mm -hmm. If somebody says that you are a, I don't know, white, heteronormative, patriarchal, phallocentric fascist, just laugh at them and walk away. Don't fear what they, what they are saying. Don't, don't let them bludgeon you into accepting things about yourself that you know are not true. Just laugh it off and tell them they are silly. And I think that as more Americans do that, as we laugh in, uh, at them in their face, then they will stop doing it. We just need to stop encouraging them to do it. Because that's basically the left's modus operandi, is that they try to win every debate even before it starts by basically telling you that America is evil, you are evil, you have to atone for your sins, even if you haven't committed anything sinful. And that's how they win every debate. But if you refuse to be bludgeoned to submission, and if you stand up for yourself, then I think we'll be fine. Yeah, in your book, you talk about classical liberalism. For the American audience, can you explain the difference between classical liberalism and the liberalism of the left in the United States? Because they're certainly not the same thing. And I think a lot of people get that confused when they hear about classical liberalism versus being a Democrat in the United States. Yeah. I'm a liberal. I am a liberal. And I'm the exact opposite in many ways than what American liberals call themselves. I'm a classical liberal, meaning I'm the original liberal in the European sense. Euro liberalism originates in Europe as an opposition to feudalism, aristocracy, royalty, and privilege. By privilege, I mean that in Europe, certain classes of people had more rights than others. The nobility had more rights than, than the peasantry and the middle class. And liberalism basically rises in Europe in the 18th century, especially, as an ideology of equality before the law. Liberals, classical liberals, myself, we believe in equality before the law. 
We believe in freedom of speech. We believe in individual rights and responsibilities. We believe in meritocracy. We believe in reason. We believe in science. And uh, basically, the American left, which calls itself liberal, but is fundamentally illiberal. I, I never use the word liberal when describing the left in America. I use progressive. Progressives basically don't believe in much of that. They don't believe in free speech. They would want to control it. They don't believe in uh, individual rights and responsibilities. They believe in group rights and responsibilities. They don't believe in equality before the law because they believe that certain people should have more rights than others, which is kind of weird because <laughs> on the far right, that is what the far right used to believe, and maybe some of them still do. They don't believe in meritocracy. They believe that people should rise through the ranks of corporations or universities based on their immutable characteristics. So much of what goes on on the American left is not liberalism of any kind. When I talk to fellow classical liberals or libertarians, I call myself a liberal because that's what we are. And American liberals are not liberal. They are illiberal. They are the enemies of individual rights, of freedom of speech, of equality before the law. All those things that made the West the best place in the world to be and to live. How did the American leftist party then kind of take on these tenets? I hear some people say that the left and the right kind of flipped in the United States, but it, it seems like the, the left has always kind of been anti-human. Well, I mean, look, we have problem on both sides of the political spectrum. It's not like the left is the only part of the political spectrum which is going off the rails. Uh, <laughs> you have a lot of insanity on American right as well. The, the problem really here is polarization and the shrinking of, of the middle, uh, I think. You ask a question about, I, I don't really know what happened, why this polarization happened, except that for some reason, identity became much more important in terms of how we perceive the world, how the leftists perceive the world, and perhaps even some people on the right, but primarily the leftists perceive the world. Why? I don't really know. I'm not a political scientist. I can't explain it, uh, except possibly reference the Maslow hierarchy of values, is that when everything else in your life has been taken care of, you have your food, you have your water, you have your lodgings, you have your clothing, you have your job, you have your career. At the top of this Maslow pyramid of, or hierarchy of values is, sorry, hierarchy of needs, hierarchy of needs is really identity and um, self-actualization. There is a reason why I think uh, it is the most fortunate people in our society who tend to embrace identitarianism. It is the wealthiest because everything else is, has been taken care of in their lives. And so all they have left is to talk about things at the top of that Maslow pyramid of needs, which is self-actualization. They have a lot of time and a lot of resources to be thinking about themselves. Other people have other priorities. I heard the saying, if you're hungry, you have one problem. And if you're not, then you have many problems. We constantly hear what will happen with overpopulation, but we very rarely hear what would actually happen with underpopulation or a population collapse. You talk a lot about China in the book with their one child policy, two child policy, and we have a big aging global population. What's the future going to look like in say 10 years as we have all these boomers dying off and the replacement rate is, is not even keeping up with the current population? The main premise of the book is that it is only human beings who are capable of generating new ideas which can move society forward. So if we are going to have a population that's going to decline and produce fewer ideas, then economic growth must suffer as a consequence. Now, we could compensate for having fewer people in the world by increasing the number of people who are living in freedom. You see, population is not enough to produce abundance. If it was enough, then China would have been the richest country in the world for the last 2000 years. China has always had the most people in the world, but China has been very poor until recently. So what you need is a lot of people who are also free to think and to write, etc. You see why freedom of speech, that sort of thing are, are linked within our framework, within our model. Because people must be free. Only then can they actualize their ideas and improve the world. So if you have it, 
declining population, you could still have a lot of economic growth if freedom spreads. There are huge chunks of the world which are unfree right now. A lot of Africa is unfree. A lot of Latin America is unfree. A lot of Asia is unfree. If those countries and those regions became free, then you could have many more mines coming out of Africa and out of Latin America and out of Asia, creating value for all of us. There are plenty of geniuses right now throughout these regions who are never going to improve humanity because they cannot get out and they cannot actualize their ideas. That's why we were talking about Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, his father, came to the United States from Syria. And if his father never came from Syria, then Steve Jobs, this genius, his genius would have been wasted in Syria. He would never have created Apple, right? And so I'm sure that there are plenty of geniuses living in unfree regions and unfree countries who are never going to contribute to the stock of human knowledge because they live in unfreedom. If we have more freedom, then we can compensate for, for declining population by having just more people who are free. But if we are going to have a declining population and also declining freedom, then that's a problem. I heard you say in a previous interview that 90% of plastic in the oceans flowed there from just eight rivers in Asia and Africa. How does superabundance lead to a cleaner and greener planet? Well, wealthier people tend to be better stewards of the planet. There, there is no question about it. If you don't believe me, uh, I don't mean you, but your listeners, just go to the Yale Environmental Quality Index and there's a strong correlation between the income per capita environmental quality. Basically, the richer people are, the more they are willing to spend on the environment. Poor people are not good stewards of the environment. When poor people are hungry, they're going to slaughter the animals in the wild. You go to a poor country, you see there is rubbish everywhere. Nobody cares whether you dispose of your plastic bag or whatever paper bag in the street or in the trash can. Just, just go to any poor country and it's much dirtier. So the richer we are, the better protectors of nature we are. And also what tends to happen is that as we become wealthier, as our economy grows, then more and more people are attracted to the cities. There is huge urbanization going on. By 2100, 80% of all humans will be living in cities. So what, what does that mean? That means that millions of acres of land are going to be returned back to nature, back to animals and back to flora. And so the best way to protect the biosphere, the best way to make sure that huge chunks of the world are returned to, to nature is to have a lot of urbanization and a lot of growth so that all of those people move off land and move into cities. I'm some, somewhat familiar with Brazil. Brazil has a lot of economic activity, but it's on the coast. And deforestation in the Amazon forest happens obviously inland, where people are much poorer. They're cutting down forests in order to raise cattle and that sort of thing. The Amazon forest is important because it's old forest. There is a lot of biosphere there that we want to protect and that sort of thing. If we can move those people from inland of Brazil, where they are very poor, into the cities on the coasts, where they are going to be richer and produce more value for the rest of humanity, then Amazon will bounce back very quickly. If you don't believe me, just leave your house and the garden untended for a couple of years. You come back and you suddenly realize that nature has really rebounded very quickly. Nature has within it a tremendous potential and ability to reconstitute itself if we just leave it alone. And urbanization is the way to do it. Also, improvements in agricultural productivity is the way to do it. If we can grow our food on fewer acres of land, which we can, using increased agricultural productivity, then, of course, we can return even more land to nature. So a final question. I think your book is 585 pages. If people had just one takeaway point, what would you say like, would be the main point that you wish that they would take away from this book, Superabundance? People are not a cancer on the planet. Bringing child into the world is not an act of selfishness. It is an act of benefaction to the world because the more 
children there are, the more people there are, the more likely it is that we are going to produce a genius capable of solving cancer or bring back extinct species or increase our life expectancy to 200 years. All we need is more people and more ideas. And every newborn comes into the world, not just with an empty stomach, but also with a brain capable of improving the lives of others. Don't buy into the doomsayers and the apocalyptists. Look around you and ask yourself, is this really a horrible world to live in compared to what? At what other period in human history have people had as much and uh, have had it as good as we have in the West today? Yeah, I think people romanticize the past, but it's we have it pretty good right now. Thank you so much, Marion, for joining us today. Can you let people know where they can find you, where they can get your book? or or? Well, the book, Superabundance, is obviously available on Amazon. If you want to read more about it, please go to superabundance.com, superabundance.com, or just read the book. I have a lot of interviews on online. You can check those out. And the book is probably intended for people in the late teens and over. But some of the videos that I have made are also intended for children so that children understand that they don't have to worry about dying in a global apocalypse in eight years' time or whatever, whenever AOC's um, uh, prediction is not going to come true. So we aim at adults primarily with this book, but it's up to the adults to spread the word to the kids so that kids are not terrified of life on Earth. And do you narrate it yourself for the audio version or did you have someone? There, there is no audio version yet, no audio. Okay, uh, but there are a lot of videos with me where I, where I sort of talk about the book and, and the main findings. But there's no audio version because there are a lot of numbers in it, but yeah, let that not scare you. People who don't like numbers will still find a lot in the book that they will like. So, Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you spending an hour with us today. And Thank you very much. All the best. And that is it for this episode of El Podcast. What a stellar show. Once again, if you're not yet subscribed, please subscribe on YouTube and Rumble. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. We thank you all for listening from the bottom of our hearts, and we will see you on the next episode. Okay.